This program was made possible by Coeric Incorporated. Thank you, Coeric, for your generous support. Heartbeat Alaska is brought to you in part by Brown's Electric Lighting Gallery. Thank you, Brown's Electric, for your generous support of Heartbeat Alaska. Heartbeat Alaska is also sponsored by the Norton Sound Economic Development Corporation, serving the fisheries of the Bering Strait region. Heartbeat Alaska is also brought to you by Frontier Flying Service. Thank you, Frontier, for getting Heartbeat Alaska airborne. This program is also brought to you by ASRC Energy Services, a subsidiary of Arctic Slope Regional Corporation. Heartbeat Alaska is also made possible through the support of Norton Sound Health Corporation. One, two, three, four, let's go. It's Heartbeat. It's a fabulous show. Alaska. Hi, Heartbeat Alaska. It's Heartbeat. <laughs> Alaska. Pull up a chair and enjoy the show. You hear it from Sitka to Barrow. Gather around. Hello everyone and welcome to Heartbeat Alaska Native News and Information. I'm Jeannie Green. Thank you so much for joining me. Today we travel to my homeland, the homeland of my ancestors, the North Slope to the Arctic. My grandfather, Tony Jewell, was a Nupiat. He was born at Point Hope. He was also a whaling captain. We travel to Barrow, Alaska and many other villages thanks to Arctic Slope Regional Corporation's Energy Services. I'll be back with this fabulous show right after this. I'm an Alaska native and I live a healthy lifestyle. I don't need tobacco. It's not hard. I spend time with my family. I spend time outside. I love life, and tobacco is not a part of it. This message brought to you by the Alaska Department of Health and Human Services and Eastern Aleutian Tribes. Thousands of years ago, my ancestors crossed the Chukchi Sea. And today, many villages that were founded long ago still exist in the same locations. The history of the North is very fascinating. Stay with me, you're going to learn so much of the Inupiat people of the North. The following program is brought to you by ASRC Energy Services, a subsidiary of Arctic Slope Regional Corporation. Over 13,000 years ago, a great migration into Alaska occurred across a land bridge that may never be crossed again. During the Ice Age, some 23,000 years ago, much of the Earth's water supply was huge ice masses vast areas of land that were once underwater. Almost 350 feet below today's sea level were exposed. For North America and Siberia, the result of the huge ice masses exposed a continuous land bridge known as Beringia that stretched between the two continents. Scientists believe that this land bridge served as a crossing for travelers migrating from Asia to populate the Americas. Studies show that there were three major migrations from Siberia to North America. The land bridge provided a route for the first group, who we now know as American Indians. They migrated straight through Alaska into Canada and North America. The land bridge also provided a route for the Athabascan Indians, who settled in the interior of Alaska, the Tlingit, Haida, and Tsimshin, who settled in southeast Alaska, and the Aleut Eskimo people who settled in the Aleutian Islands. The third migration that occurred after the flood of the land bridge were Inupiat, who traveled north to settle in the western and northern regions of Alaska and Canada. 
Historical evidence discovered in the Barrow and Point Hope region confirms Inupiat existence in Alaska's North Slope area over 4,000 years ago. In 1826, English explorers Captain W. Beachy and Captain John Franklin began plotting the coastline of North America. When exploring Alaska's North Slope region, they gave various North Slope villages English names after their crew members. Each village had an Inupiat name, but the pronouncing of the Inupiat names were difficult for Captain Beachy and his crew. For example, Point Hope was named after Sir William Johnston Hope, the map maker for the expedition. The Anubiat name for Point Hope is Stikikyak, translated into English to mean point. Prior to receiving the name of Point Hope, the village was called Old Tigara, New Tigara, and Epayudak. There were once almost 5,000 people living in Apiatak. But German measles and influenza wiped out most of the population. According to the 2000 census, Point Hope's population is 757. Traditional subsistence activity supplemented with a moderate cash economy is the lifestyle of this Inupiat community. North of Point Hope lies the village of Point Lay. Point Lay is the last remaining village of the Kupara people. The origin of how Point Lake got its name is unknown. Captain Beachy did have a botanist by the name of Lay, but it is only speculation that the village was named after him. The Anubiat name for Point Lay is Kali, translated into English to Mound. Approximately 247 people reside in Point Lay. The beach formation near the village restricts the village's ability to hunt bowhead whales. Beluga whales are herded into a nearby lagoon and are harvested by Point Lay residents. Further north along Alaska's western North Slope coastline is the village of Wainwright. Captain Beachy named the village after Lieutenant John Wainwright. The Inupiat name for Wainwright is Ulgunik, meaning slope. Wainwright is the third largest village on the North Slope with over 546 people who have sustained a lifestyle from the land and waters that surround them. The ancestors of Wainwright include the Utukumut and Kukumut people. Whaling, hunting, and gathering provide the essentials for these Inupiat people. In the past, coal was mined just seven miles from the village. Today, perhaps the most recognized of all North Slope villages is Barrow, which was named after Sir John Barrow, another map maker for Captain Beachy. Barrow's Inupiat name is Ukwiavik, which means place to go owl hunting. Home to over 4,500 people, Barrow is the hub of the North Slope and the business center of the region. In 1946, the United States Navy came to Barrow and began exploration on National Petroleum Reserve 4. The Naval Arctic Research Laboratory, soon to follow, did extensive study on animals and plant life in the region. The lab would pay Inupiat children 25 cents for lemmings and one dollar for lemmings brought in alive. Located on the Colvo River Delta, Nuiqsut was established in 1973. The Inupiat word Inuiqsut means somewhere beautiful over the horizon. Although Nuiqsut is surrounded by the alpine oil fields and the constant reminders of the oil industry, it is still somewhere beautiful over the horizon. With the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act of 1971, 27 families moved from Barrow and the surrounding campsites to the present site of Nuiqsut, where they spent the first unforgiving winter living in tents until houses were eventually built. Today, Nuiqsut is home for over 433 people who continue to live a traditional subsistence lifestyle. Kaktovik means place for saining. 
It is located 90 miles west of the Canadian border on the northern edge of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Kaktovik got its name when Pipsuk from Canning River traveled there to fish and drowned. The people of Kaktovik recovered his body with a seining net. Kaktovik was a trading place for whalers and Inupiat during the commercial whaling era. Today, this subsistence-based community of 293 plus people continue the tradition of whaling and hunting. During the coal mining era, it was named Mead River, but to the Inupiat people who have lived here forever, it is known as Atkasak, which means lower level. With a population of over 228 people, Atkasak has the biggest town site on the North Slope with over 27,000 acres. Atakduvik Pass sits approximately 250 miles northwest of Fairbanks and about the same distance southeast of Barrow. Anaktuvik Pass translated into English means the place of caribou droppings. This village of a little over 282 people lies at the gate of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Anaktuvik Pass is a historic caribou migration route. However, in the early 1900s, the original nomadic Nunamute left the area due to a collapse in the caribou numbers. Many returned in the 1940s to establish the present-day village of Anaktuvik Pass. Mind, body, and spirit. I'm a naturopathic physician. Tobacco is, is a symptom of often mind, body, spirit reaction to trying to get back into balance. Nicotine's definitely something that's uh, been put on the list as potent and as addictive as heroin. If you look deeper at finding your peace of mind, incredible experience actually. We are how we live, mind, body, and spirit. The Inupiat people of the North Slope, for the most part, live in a treeless surrounding with no mountains. So they make their homes and other useful tools with what surrounds them. Inupiat are mainly nomadic people who are believed to have migrated from Siberia to escape from other warring groups, only to find themselves defending their hunting grounds from the interior Athabascan Indians. Whaling is a valued tradition among the Inupiat people of the North Slope that provides not only meat and muktuk for residents, but also opportunities to gather and celebrate a way of life that remains as strong today as it did centuries ago. The Inupiat culture is based on whaling, fishing, hunting seals, walrus, caribou, seabirds, and gathering the necessities for survival. Inupiat people are highly skilled in making tools with stone and ivory, tools that were often used in the pursuit of their staples. Here you see an Inupiat using a drill and bow, which was used to make tools. These artifacts were found in Barrow in the early 1980s. The purse is made from caribou skin sewed together with sinew. The button is made from ivory, which came from the tusks of the walrus. The snow goggles are made from driftwood and served as modern-day sunglasses. Polo stones tied together with sinew were used as duck slings. The cup is made of thin wood and is stitched with baleen. There are two different types of fishing hooks. One is made of wood with an ivory hook, and the other is made of ivory with a metal hook. The hair comb is also made of ivory. Other artifacts that demonstrate the ingenuity of the Inupiat are a skin scraper that was used to clean dried animal skins, an ulu with a metal blade used for cutting, a thimble holder used in heavy skin sewing, a harpoon blade, a basket made from willow roots, a dart point used for hunting, and mittens made from polar bear and caribou. Traditionally, Inupiat made their clothing from animal skins, caribou, wolf, squirrel, polar bear, seal, and even duck skins. Here the woman on the left 
is wearing a caribou parka with the fur turned inside and waterproof mufflers. The woman on the right is wearing a caribou parka with the fur turned outside. The man on the far left is wearing a caribou parka with a white snow shirt. White snow shirts were generally worn by deacons and elders of the church on Sundays. On his feet are sealskin sole mufflers that were traditionally worn with caribou skin liners and grass or rope insoles. The woman next to him is wearing a caribou skin parka with a walrus tusk design and a wolverine fur ruff which serves as a face mask. The man next to them is wearing an everyday snow shirt and a caribou parka with the fur inside. Anubayat women made their parkas with extra large hoods to carry their babies. For hunting and traveling, they usually wore pants made from polar bear and wool. The homes of the Anubayat were as creatively made as their clothing. Made from the earth, their sod homes usually had whale bone frames and a low tunnel entry for heat efficiency. Sometimes the frames of the sod house were made of driftwood. Igloos or snow houses were used only as temporary shelters when hunting or traveling in the winter. <coughs> driftwood also served another purpose. Dog teams were in use as early as 1600 AD and the sleds were made from driftwood with bone runners. During the winter, sleds served as a main means of travel. During the summer, dogs were used to pack supplies. With the invention of the snow machine in the 1960s, dog teams became obsolete. Today, dog teams are a source of recreation and sporting events. Nearly everyone on the North Slope owns a snow machine. Another source of transportation is the umiak. Umiaks have been used by Inupiat whalers for centuries with very little change to their design. Made with wood frames, the umiaks are covered with walrus or seal skins that have been sewn together. Inupiat women have perfected waterproof skin sewing. The skins are stretched over the frame of the umiak and tied off using rope. Traditionally, strips of caribou hide were used as rope. Most of the umiaks were rigged for sale, allowing for a silent approach on their prey. The kayak is also another popular mode of transportation that is still used today. Smaller than the umiak, the kayaks were used to chase and hunt seals. Similar to the umiak, the kayak is built of wood and covered with skins. Usually built for one person, the kayak is easy to maneuver and lightweight, allowing a hunter to cross the lead easier. It is through the passing down of traditions from one generation to the next that keeps the Inupiat culture alive. Knowledge of their surroundings and the skills of survival that are key to living in the harsh conditions of the Alaska's North Slope. They were lessons learned by watching, listening, and performing. There were no blueprints or written directions because there was no written language. It wasn't until 1890 that the Inupiat had a written language. Before then, stories and legends were told by word of mouth. Unfortunately, much of Anubiat history was forgotten or lost. In 1968, Reverend Roy Amawa translated the Bible into the Anubiat language. It was later revised in 1971 with the help of Martha Aiken. Today, the Anubiat language has been documented and translated into an abridged Anubiat and English dictionary translated by Edna Agiak McLean. For centuries, the common belief was that the well-being of the Inupiat people rested upon the spirits and the one person who could communicate with them, the shaman. Today, 
Christianity is the dominant religion of the Inupiat, but it hasn't always been that way. In 1880, a meeting took place in New York between the Presbyterian, Baptists, and Methodists to decide which denominations would cover which area of the state of Alaska so that there would not be any competition among them. The Russian Orthodox religion had already been established in parts of southwest Alaska and throughout the southeast panhandle of Alaska. Today, there are several different denominations across the state, with often more than one in each village. In 1890, Leander M. Stevenson became the first Presbyterian missionary of Barrow. He was also a teacher and a doctor, as well as the keeper of the refuse station for shipwrecked whaling vessels. At the same time, John B. Driggs had gone to Point Hope, serving as an Episcopal missionary, doctor, and teacher to the Inupiat people. Both missionaries were not particularly successful obtaining conversion, but did perform some heroic medical practices while in Barrow and Point Hope. Driggs left Alaska, but returned and lived out the rest of his life in a small village north of Point Hope. Dr. Harry W. Greist was the fourth missionary to come to Barrow during the 1920s and is credited with saving many lives. Greist captured many photos of Barrow in the 20s with his camera, leaving us with images of a time gone by. There would be many more missionaries making their way north to convert the Inupiat people to a different religion. The main means of traveling north was via passenger ships and freighters like this one. This particular freighter made an annual trip along the North Slope coast to Barrow, hauling supplies that were used in schools, hospitals, and stores. By the 1940s, these vessels were replaced by steamships. When these ships arrived in port, it was the one time that locals had a chance to earn a little money unloading these vessels. In the late 1920s and 30s, Arctic expeditions were becoming common. Explorers wanted to learn more about the North and the people who called it home. In 1930, this Russian search and rescue plane spent two weeks looking for another Russian plane that was lost in the area. They would never find the missing plane. On a lighter note, one expedition leader, Mr. Valhilmer Stephenson, made his way to Barrow where he measured all of the people's heads. Thereafter, he was nicknamed Head Measure. Three years later, in 1933, Charles Lindbergh and his wife made a stop at Barrow during his northern route on a European expedition. The whole village was there to greet the pilot and his wife. It seemed that the Inupiat people had a fascination with airplanes. In fact, when the first DC-3 landed in Barrow, the Alaska Territorial Guard were there to keep people away from the plane. In the 1940s, Wien Airlines started making weekly trips up to Barrow. Sig and Noel Wien would alternate trips each week. The whole village would turn out every time. In 1935, Will Rogers and Wiley Post made a stop in Wallapak, 12 miles west of Barrow, to ask directions from camper Claire Okpiagak and his family. While taken off, their plane crashed. They never did make it to Barrow. Claire ran 12 miles to town to deliver the bad news. Mr. Rogers and Mr. Post were looking for a better route to Siberia. Today, there's a monument built at the crash site, and the airport at Barrow is named after them. During World War II, the Inupiat people were very involved in defending our nation. Many Inupiat were enlisted in the Alaska Territorial Guard. Muktuk Marston was their organizer. Those that didn't go to war stayed busy preparing the village for a surprise attack. They would place canisters containing food and ammunition in strategic places, marking their location on a map. Like the rest of the nation, the Inupiat villages were going through blackout raids every so often. Even smoking outside was prohibited. The air raid warden would come around and let everyone know when light was showing through their window covers. On a funny note, 
One eyewitness account recalls one squad leader forgetting the commands during one of their drills and watching the squad march right into a pond. They were waist deep in the pond before they got turned around. Lloyd Akavana was the highest ranking Inupiat during the 1960s and 70s. General John Schaefer is the highest ranking Inupiat today. The late 1950s would be the beginning of a series of changes for the Inupiat people of the North. In 1959, Alaska gained statehood with the backing of the U.S. government. Alaska would be guaranteed rights and freedoms that were now inherently theirs. Or should I say most of Alaska? For the indigenous people of Alaska, it would be a time to fight for their rights, the same rights that were being granted to the rest of the state. everyone for joining us for Heartbeat Alaska and thank you Art of Soap Regional Corporations Energy Services for bringing this program to the viewers of Heartbeat Alaska which cross state lines and the boundaries of countries. We'll soon be airing in Australia. Isn't that exciting? They'll be sending us video of the Aboriginal people in that country and we'll share that with you. Stay tuned for part two. Look for us for part two of the history of the Inupiat people. A fascinating story of adapting in one of the world's harshest climates, adapting in today's world. I'll see you next week. God bless every single one of you. Feel that heartbeat deep in your soul. Doesn't